A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. We are recording this on July 14th, 2021. And our guest today is my friend, friend of the show, criminal defense attorney, Allison Treasel. Hi, Allison, how are you? I'm so good. It's great to see you. And I love being part of your show. Really enjoyable. We love having you. And we very much appreciate the fact that you are in a hotel room. We won't say where because your son is traveling for his baseball games. So we really appreciate that, mom. (laughs) You know what? Look, you you have to juggle as a working mom. um, But being able to do things like this and take them on the road How lucky am I? How great is technology? It's wonderful. It really is. And it's important to always be there for these moments in life, right? That's all that matters. I'm getting I'm getting updates on my phone as to how he's doing. So so that's all good. Okay, we'll we'll get you out there real fast. (laughs) Oh, we have some crazy cases this week. One of Allison's favorite, also one of mine will be coming up in just a second. So here's what we're looking at. Police are sharing details of the case of Faye Swetlick. Now, she's a South Carolina first grader who went missing after school in February of last year, and she was found dead days later. What's interesting is that the police have decided to release a lot of the evidence and the case, even though nothing has really changed. So so that's interesting. We're going to discuss that in a few minutes. But first, Allison's favorite case, a crime saga out of St. Louis, This case has a lot of twists and turns. This, of course, is my personal favorite only because it has my favorite mugshot of all time, right? This is the one where the suspect, Pam Hupp, looks like she has menstrual pads wrapped around her neck after this, like, sad attempt to take a pen and, like, stab herself in the jail bathroom because she was trying to avoid the whole thing. She never really inflicted any serious, you know, damage to herself. Which only, to the, only to the other people that she heard. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But that mugshot is priceless. It's my favorite. Thanks. And it's interesting, Allison. I always thought uh, that the Lori Vallow case was your absolute favorite. Today, you you have breaking news. It's this one. You know, there's so many. Tw- she's twisted. OK, Pamela Hupp is a twisted individual. But the what what blows my mind about her case, because, you know, I am a working criminal defense attorney is how she was able to snow an entire criminal justice system. This woman went to the police, said this guy did it. And I know we're going to get into the facts, but then she carried that lie through. And at no point along the way did someone say, this this woman's full of it. She's crazy. And so it's one of the greatest injustices that I've ever seen. Um, but a master manipulator, a total psychopath, and just the pathology behind Pam Hupp fascinates me and the failings of the criminal justice system um, for Russ um, shock and sadden me. So that's why. Yep. She's a convicted murderer right now, and she's facing another charge, which is what we're talking about. That's why she's back in the news, although it feels like she's never really ever left the headlines. Pam Hupp of Missouri, who is serving a life prison, a life sentence in prison for killing a man in her home, is now charged with the murder of a second person, Elizabeth Betsy Faria, a woman with cancer who was stabbed 55 times and was considered a friend of Pam's. Pam was supposedly helping her through her very difficult time with cancer. Now, while it is still to be determined by a court if Pam killed Betsy, one thing has been settled here. Pam Hupp framed Betsy's husband, Russell Faria, for Betsy's murder. Russ served more than three years in prison before he was finally exonerated. This is the crime you've been talking about. It's it's unbelievable what she did. It's shocking. It is absolutely shocking. And um, poor Russ comes home and he finds his wife uh, dead. And there is a knife in her neck. 
most of the stab wounds are not immediately visible to him. He makes this frantic 911 call that would later be used against him as a fabrication, right? Mm -hmm. And if you actually know that he discovers the wife that he has loved, they have just renewed their vows. He knows that she's been suicidal because she is um, has terminal cancer. Um, and so when the police say to him, Russ, what do you think happened? And he said, well, I think she killed herself because she had attempted before and talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, he has an airtight alibi. Anna, these do not happen. I mean, it does not happen that four independent witnesses can vouch for someone and say he was with us. He was with us all night. He has receipts from a restaurant that he was at at the time that the killing took place. Right. All About 20 the, minutes away. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it appears, not it appears, the police turned a blind eye to all of that and focus solely on Russ. Yeah, Th let's give everyone a little bit of a timeline here so then they'll understand why it's such a big deal that Pam Hupp has now been charged with Betsy's murder. Remember, Russ was charged, convicted, exonerated. And this poor woman, the dead woman, the victim here, has been waiting for justice this entire time while the criminal justice system is doing this craziness of pointing everything in a different direction but never really where it should be. So December 27th, 2011, okay? We're going back 10 years ago. Hup, this is, you know, so Pam all of a sudden turns up at Betsy's chemotherapy. And this is really important because she arrives at the chemotherapy session and she says, I'm taking you home. You're not well enough. I want to take care of you. So that in itself is a little weird. But if you look back and you're looking at premeditation, so the whole point was to pick her up, get her home. Now, remember, she's charged with killing Betsy, innocent until proven guilty, right? Because we've been down this path before with Russ, so we want to be extra careful here. So Russ comes home, as you said, finds Betsy dead on the floor, and she had been stabbed 55 times. Now, this is Russ's uh, movie night. He goes and he hangs out with some pals and they watch movies at home. They play games. It's like a game night. It, exactly. It is a reoccurring event that he always does. Right. Which is important because Pam would have known that this was the night that Russ was always out. I have to say this immediately. So of, all, of some of the more chilling sort of chain of events... When Russ is interviewed by the police, unbeknownst to him, Pam is setting him up, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying, uh, my, my best friend, Betsy, didn't love him anymore. She was planning on leaving him. He was abusive to her. At the same time, Russ is saying, oh, yes, Pam is such a dear friend to Betsy. She's so nice and caring and compassionate and my goodness my my wife was suffering and thank goodness she has this support system in Pam Hub right what wasn't evident quite then but became evident and was not allowed into the murder trial which is shocking is that Betsy had turned over her life insurance policy to Pam Hupp. So for years, I have always wondered what in the world did Pam say to Betsy to get her to sign that $150,000 life insurance policy over to her? Because there would be a subsequent hearing on whether she had, in fact, that was her intention. And a judge found it was her intention. But I'm just wondering if it wasn't done under duress and she didn't, you know, because it was done prior to the murder. Um, what did she say to her? Did she say, look, I want to do this as a favor to you and make sure that all the proceeds get distributed to your children in the event something happens? What made what did Pam say that was so convincing to Betsy that Betsy would say, yes, this is such a trusted friend. And this goes to how manipulative 
and psychotic this woman is that she was willing to convince a dying woman that she was best able to follow and carry out her intentions of caring for her children. Yeah. And what's amazing is you referred to there was um, a case way after where um, Betsy's daughter challenged the fact that Pam had been the beneficiary of this life insurance policy, that her if her mother truly intended for the the kids to get the money, like why give it to Pam? And if you did give it to Pam, then Pam, give it to, to the daughters, right? Well, this is what I love. Pam bought a house. Wait, wait, no, 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 Pam, she did buy a house, but this is what I love. Pam actually testified many times and and told the police this incredible story that she was walking around with a sack of $150,000 and had planned to give it to the daughter. <laughs> I mean, just hadn't bizarre, found the time. <laughs> bizarro, right? I mean, just bizarro. And then yeah. she changed her mind and then she bought the house. But the, the shocking part is to actually tell someone, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was carrying around the $150,000. I meant to give it to you. I was going to give it to you. But you know what? I saw this house. Yeah. I had to get it. My bad. Had to buy a house. And then I think what is such an insult is then as the court determines, because it was challenged whether had it been, I am going to argue, isn't it possible that the whole thing was a forgery, even though the judge maybe was not able to prove, you know, you know or I've, am I just going off on a limb? No, no, no. I thought about that a lot. And, and my problem with that, right? My problem with that is you got to believe there were forensic experts involved um, that said, no, this was her signature. Now they could have been wrong, of course. Right. By the way, insult to injury here is one of the reasons she gives the police why she would never kill her friend for money is she said, when my mother dies, I'm going to be super wealthy. I don't need the money because she has a half a million dollar life insurance policy that all goes to me. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, Anna, what happens? (laughs) Her mother trips off a balcony with him being in her system. And the last person to see her alive? Pam Hub. Her daughter, shocking, yeah. right? It's like you could, it's like the woman has a black cloud. Just stay away, just stay away from Pam Hupp. So I want to get back to to the case against Russell because what's amazing here is this the whole the whole concept of that there was a different beneficiary, that what would Russ's motive have been to kill his wife if he didn't get the insurance policy? The jury never, ever heard that information ever. And I think that would really make them wonder, wait a minute, what the heck was the motive? So what, and this is what I was talking about um, in the breakdown of the criminal justice system here, okay? I've been a defense attorney for 25 years. I have never heard of an occasion where you're excluded from presenting a defense you have to be able to present an alternative theory of the case. You have you have a right to present a defense. And it is a very strong defense that not only did this other person do it, here is the motive for how they did it, why they did it. And she received $150,000. I'm sure a jury would want to know that. Yes. And would want to know why. And she stood to gain $150,000 if this woman dies and her husband is framed for the murder. And gets convicted. So the jury trial convicts Russ Faria of murder and he gets sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. Yes. Man's never, ever going to get out. Finally. And finally, by the way, yeah. by the way. Mm -hmm. Betsy's family and friends who initially were very supportive of Russ, Betsy's parents turn on him at some point. Yeah. And so the tragedy is not just the three years he spent in prison, which is unthinkable, but that the people who loved him and supported him turned on him because this evil woman falsely accused him and they started to believe the, those lies as well. Mm-hmm. So 
not only did he have to get out of prison and rebuild his life, but all of those relationships that were so important to him. You know, how do you come back from that? I don't know that you do. I, I really don't. You can't give him his time back. Yeah. You can. Well, fortunately, there was someone who did believe in him. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch and KTVI TV did a joint investigation of Betsy's murder. And one of the lead reporters on that was Chris Hayes, who worked a lot with Crime Watch Daily at the time, and they discovered that there had been a lot of suppressed evidence, and all of that helped to get a new trial. And then finally, in November of 2015, remember she was killed in 2011, in the retrial, the judge finds that Russ is not guilty of Betsy's murder, and he walks free out of three, after three years. And we've got, Allison, we have, he did an interview, Russ Faria did an interview along with the reporter, Chris Hayes, who did a lot of work on this. They sat down with Crime Watch Daily at the time on the set to discuss what the process had been like. Let's just listen to Russ in his own words. Unfortunately, there was a lot of evidence that was suppressed in the first trial. Things that weren't allowed to be presented. My lawyer, the way I put it is, was like a boxer with his hands tied behind his back. There were a whole series of failures in that first trial that now surely have to be examined more closely. The biggest failure was the the suppression of evidence from a witness who was the last person to report seeing Betsy alive and who benefited from a life insurance policy and the jury never heard it, and it was astounding. Russ, you now walking out as a free man, there has still been no justice for Betsy. Who killed her? Well, I have my beliefs about that. Again, I don't want to throw stones at anybody, but there is overwhelming evidence that Pam Hub had something to do with it. Russ, this is probably a difficult question, but it has been alleged that there was a, a relationship going on between Pam Hub and your wife. Pam herself has said that they were having a, a lesbian relationship. What, what do you say to that? Anybody that knew my wife, and I, mean, I knew her probably more than anyone, I really honestly don't believe that's, that's the case. She's been interviewed 13 times by the authorities and lawyers, and I believe she's given 13 different stories. So it's a matter of which one is the truth, if any of them are. So Allison, even Russ is saying that the authorities interviewed Pam at least 13 times. And yeah. we saw, based on those interrogation tapes that have been shared, her story was ever-changing. It was like a moving target, this woman. So sometimes, okay, police officers get blinders on. And they find evidence to fit their theory of the case. Now, most police officers are incredible what they do and their intentions are pure and terrific, but all of us are human. And when you wholeheartedly believe that the husband did it, you may ignore the fact that this woman is changing her story over and over again She's a bizarre human being. I mean, she's a strange woman, but the way that she would explain Russ was a very gradual, well, you know, he's a decent enough guy, but my friend really said, I'm leaving him. I was there for her and I'm the only one that knows this. Um, you know, later she would, she would explain that the reason was that Betsy was actually in love with her and although they never had a sexual relationship, there was a lesbian attraction. And so her story would change, but parts of it remained constant, which was Russ is the bad guy. I'm the savior. And my friend needed me um, at her most vulnerable times. And I was there and he was nowhere to be found. Allison, I have a question here. As part of this new murder charge that Pam has been charged with Betsy's murder, and there's going to be presumably a trial unless she pleads out, that part of the charges in the investigation, the authorities are saying they want to investigate what went wrong 
with the first trial. How does that happen? And is that up to them? Or is that the attorney general, the state attorney general's Right. right. I mean, job? I don't think that another prosecuting agency has to put eyes on it. I mean, there's just too big of a bias. But when I was preparing for this and reading the words from the head prosecutor, who's now different than the prosecutor at the time, were, we're going to see if there was criminal conduct here. So it's not just whether something went wrong in our system that we can fix. Well, did these prosecutors or these police officers do something criminal? I mean, that 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 is the words of this prosecutor is that he's looking into whether in fact there was criminal conduct. So that's very unusual, as you know. I mean, that, that's a very unusual occurrence that a prosecutor would say, did they actually commit crimes by concealing or destroying evidence? That's interesting, Anna. Incredible. So as if this were not a bizarre enough case, we have to get into some other components. They may not have a bearing on this latest murder charge that we're discussing, but I think it's really important for context as to what in the world is going on in the world of Pam Hupp. So let's let's get everyone back on the timeline. So in 2015, Russ is freed. He's exonerated. He didn't do it. Let's go forward one year to 2016. This to me is so egregious as well. In 2016, one year later, police respond to an incident at Pam Hupp's house. Okay. Hupp tells police that a man approached her in the driveway, followed her into her house, and that she said, you know, she had been sitting in her SUV. This guy forces his way in. So she calls 911 and has 911 on the phone while she's telling this assailant, no, 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 don't come any closer, shoots the assailant while she's on the phone with 911. They get there. They find this this man named Louis Gumpenberger, 37-year-old, a handyman who had been disabled by a car accident, which had not only affected him physically, but also mentally. So he was impaired and had some judgment issues, okay? So she tells the police, oh my God, this man tried to kill me. And then police find a note stuffed in, in the, in poor Lewis's pockets and money cash is in there and a note basically saying, okay, if you kidnap Pam, I'll give you this much money. If you kill Pam, I'll give you more signed Russ Faria, of course. <laughs> well, and get Russ's money. Get Russ's yeah. money. Right. Yeah. I t- okay. So you have to imagine it's like, what? So she's now convincing the police that Russ, who has now gotten out of prison, has because been exonerated. The three years, the three years he's, this poor man spent in prison was not enough. I mean, you want to talk about evil. You want to right. talk about evil, right? Yes. Not only is there no remorse, she's going back for more. Oh, she's not done with poor Russ. Oh, like no. she's not done. She make, She sets him up. He gets convicted. He goes to prison, but that's not enough. Betsy, not Betsy, excuse me, Pam. Pam gets upset because the man gets exonerated. And what's so what's happening is when he gets exonerated, everything starts looking at Pam again. Pam's starting to lose it because now the authorities keep questioning her and, and what's going on. So they're focusing on her. She comes up with this brilliant idea where she's going to set up Russ Again, setup number two, this was all Russ is doing. He hired this man to kill her. Okay, well, it didn't take long for police to say, wow, this Pam, she's a piece of work, okay? So what she had done, because, you know, she's not the brightest bulb, she had gone into Louis Gumpenberger's neighborhood and she had been asking people in the neighborhood. She kept telling them, oh, I'm a Dateline producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I need someone to help me reenact a 911 call. I will pay you if you like pretend to be the assailant. Louis, who could not figure out that this was a setup, well, and, and by the way, I mean, it's so bizarre that even someone that's not mentally disabled when offered money and the story was, well, I'm a Dateline producer, we're reenacting this 911 call. And if you need, you know, if someone that's sort of desperate for money, they'd fall for it too. But unfortunately, poor Lewis is actually mentally disabled. I mean, she right. is, yeah, she has killed a mentally 
disabled man. And physically disabled because he also had a limp. I mean, there was a lot going on here. Lures him into her house. Um, It's it is as sick and twisted. Anna, you cover crime. Oh, it's evil. Can you believe this? No, it's evil. It's evil. It's going after someone who is the most defenseless. And I say this every time. I mean, that to me, it is these violent crimes are horrendous enough. But when you take advantage of someone so vulnerable, it is that much worse, that much worse. And this is what she did. And so what ended up happening is the police kind of started getting calls from people in the neighborhood saying, wait a minute, I saw this blonde woman. She approached me. She said she was a Dateline producer. So they pieced it all together, figured it all out. And so in 2019, Pam is sentenced to life in prison for Louis Gumpenberger's murder. She takes a plea. Yeah, she actually pleads guilty to avoid the death penalty. Probably a good move on her part. But the justice system, of course, is not done with her because now she has Betsy's murder case. And remember, she pled guilty to that case alone. So there's no death penalty for that case, but that doesn't block them from charging her in other cases, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. so if she's, just because she doesn't get the death penalty in that case doesn't mean the prosecutors can ask for it in another case. And I I just want to revisit the death of Pam's mom, which you've already, you know, alluded to and given us a few of the facts, because this one's important too. So Betsy murdered 2011. Two years later, 2013, Pam Hupp's mother, Shirley Newman, who was 77 years old, falls to her death on Halloween. Um, She lived on the third floor of a senior living community, had a balcony, Apparently, Pam had taken her out, came back, told the staff, hey, you know what? Don't be surprised if mom doesn't come down for breakfast tomorrow. Okay, don't worry. Just let her sleep in. So, by the way, Anna. Yes. uh, (laughs) That's odd. I mean, she's in a nursing care facility Mm -hmm. and you're telling the people that are paid for taking care of her, don't check on her. That's Correct. strange in and of itself, right? Of course it, it is. Very strange. <laughs> it's very strange. And Pam is the last one to see her mom. So apparently at the time, mom falls over the railing, dies, plunges to her death. And of course, there are no witnesses, no video. Police at the time call it an accident. Okay. How Pam huh? gets away with it. I mean, gets a- it's unbelievable. The wreck. I mean, it's it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. How, and by the way, this is the connection to Vallo. How come every time there's a death, the police initially rule it an accident or natural causes? I don't understand. It's shocking to me. It's shocking. It is. It is. It is shocking. At least with Lori Vallow, there were multiple, multiple states and jurisdictions where one police department could not know what was going on with the other police department. Not defending, not defending. But in this case. Uh, And I have to say, this was not a huge town. And Pam Hupp's name. I mean, this made big news at the time. Originally, the mother's death, Pam's mother's death is ruled an accident later in 2017. Basically, everything's happening in the last few years. The medical examiner changes the cause of death from accidental to undetermined. I don't know how helpful that is because, you know, while I realize everyone's looking at everything now because of the new charges based on Betsy's murder, it's, I don't know if we'll ever get justice for the mother if that was an accident. I don't think so. Look, look. I um, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually there's charges in that one too. First of all, the railing has been disturbed. Okay, that in on her balcony, um, and the amount of Ambien found in her system, what was it? Eight times the amount of what would lawfully be prescribed. I'm, I'm not sure the exact amount, but it was it was an enormous amount of Ambien in her system. I want to know if Pam Hupp had a prescription for Ambien. I wanna know if she got her hands on it somehow. And the problem with these delayed investigations, Anna, is that any video surveillance there may have been of Pam Hupp at a local pharmacy, that's gone. Oh, it's gone. 
It's gone. Yeah, it's all gone. It's all gone. So, you know, I know we went through that kind of quickly, everyone, because we really, we could go on for hours about Pam Hupp, and maybe we should one of these days, <laughs> especially with the if there is going to be a murder trial for Betsy now with the new charges. But I, I do... I do want to get to back to what is absolutely new here. It is that Pam has now been charged with this murder, with Betsy's murder. And to, just to get back to the travesty of what happened in that first trial, which I hope people will be more mindful of if there is a second trial, unless, you know, there's a plea deal here, which I'm guessing I'm feeling like that may happen if she took one for Gumpenberger. She's spending the rest of her life in prison on another case. Hmm. So... So you can look at it two ways. Just plead guilty, add another life sentence. But they are asking for the death penalty. Mm. However, Pam loves the attention. That's true. And Anna, she's got nothing else to do. That's true, too. You know, I mean, she's really got nothing else to do. And a little change of scenery in a courtroom. (laughs) I mean, I hate to be dark and cynical, but this woman, you can't see her saying, oh, no, let's go to trial. Let's go to trial. Let's do it. Let's do it. And um, they, it, apparently they're going, they're asking for the death penalty. So um, I don't think that Pam wants to be on death row. No. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a trial. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Uh, I, I it also would be very interesting to see who actually uh, agrees to defend her. One of the things, you know, you referenced how the new prosecutor in this case, who was not involved with the first prosecution against Russ, that was a disaster. And the fact that they are looking for the, you know, any potential conflicts and looking into whether there was any criminality in the way that that case was conducted. I, I do find this very interesting that Lincoln County prosecuting attorney Mike Wood said at this news conference that three separate sources told him witnesses for the prosecution, right? This is to to testify against Russ, were asked to lie on the stand. And that to me is very troubling and that there was an attempt at the time by the sheriff's department to issue an order to have all the evidence in the case destroyed. This is according to the prosecuting attorney, the new one, Mike Wood, and this is what he told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. This is very important. Well, and that, that's what I was trying to say. I mean, so we're talking top to bottom, mm-hmm. top. The judge in the case refuses to let Russ have a defense, present a defense, unheard of, unconscionable. The criminal justice system fails, fails if a defendant is not allowed to present a defense. If it is true that the prosecutors or the or law enforcement asked three witnesses to lie, not only is that a failure, it is a criminal act. It is a criminal act. Now, I have no idea whether that's true or not, and I'm not accusing them of it. Mm-hmm. I am just stating that if in fact that happened, it is a criminal act. And then the destruction or the sealing of evidence so that it cannot be revisited, that's a criminal act too. Oh, absolutely. Agreed, agreed. And at the end of the day, you have a victim here, Betsy, who really has yet to receive justice. And what's been done to this family is horrendous, horrendous. I, I, you know, we always try and watch every case that we are interested in, that we know you're interested in, but we're going to watch this one like a hawk. And yeah. and we're going to have updates on this one because Pam Hupp's going nowhere. Agreed. OK. Agreed. So before we move on to our next case, here is a quick word from our sponsor. Finding a new home that fits your family's needs can be tricky. You want room to spread out, space to gather, and a place to get away from it all. Luckily, when you need a mortgage that fits your family's needs, you go to Rocket Mortgage. With Rocket Mortgage, you can see your loan options, closing costs, tax estimates, and more all online in real time to get the full picture before anything is finalized. You can plan with certainty knowing you have a mortgage solution that works for your family. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash truecrimedaily because when you need a mortgage that fits your life, 
rocket can call for cost information and conditions equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states and mls consumer access dot org number 3030 on to our second case this is one that we covered here on the podcast but i wanted to revisit this because of the new information that's been released and allison once again i find this fascinating that the authorities have made this decision to open up and release the evidence files because the case is considered closed. And we don't see that a lot when cases are closed. You're right. But I think that there has been an overall movement toward transparency in all law enforcement agencies across the country. And what is interesting about this case is that there were a lot of conspiracy theories where the police were too quick to Uh, say that this guy did it and stop investigating. And so what the police have done, and I actually am very much in favor of what they have done, and um, I support their decision, is they said, look, this is the evidence that we had. This is what we investigated. This is why we came to the conclusion that we did, which is this man did it and um, he, he acted alone. And so I, I actually love the idea that they are being transparent. Now there were pe- there, I'm sure there's going to be people who said, oh, no, 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 that just furthers the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. But in terms of really explaining what lengths they went to in the investigation, I like what's happening here. Yeah. I, I also think that there is a degree of, of healing almost, that if you open up the books and you say, look, this was a horrible experience that the entire community felt, of course, no one could possibly feel it like the little girl's parents and family, no question about it. But I think when you do that, and if you take the time to go through what's been released, I think it could have a little bit of a a healing component saying, we know this was hard, we know this was shocking, we know we still, the answers are still not satisfying. Yes, agreed. Yeah, I agree. So so let's get to the facts of the case. Um, police have officially closed the case of a South Carolina first grader who went missing after school. This was last year, and then she was found dead a few days later. The Casey Department of Public Safety is releasing the files and the evidence because they say it's closed. And again, as we've discussed, we think it's probably the right thing for everyone to be able to view these files. What's interesting here is that it doesn't really change the facts of the case, Allison. It really doesn't. I don't think there's anything very new. There are details, but I don't, I don't get the sense that there's a lot new. And, And one thing that the case files absolutely don't answer, which I think is very hard for everyone is the why. The why. The why. There's no why here. So February 10th of 2020, Faye Marie Swetlick, six years old, a little first grader, gets off the school bus on a Monday at 245. This is in Casey, South Carolina. She's playing in the front yard. And about an hour later, the mom says that that's the last time she saw Faye playing in the front yard. It would have been 345. So an hour after she got off the school bus. So mom says that when she realized that Casey was missing, she called the police. She calls the police at 4.55. Now, what happened is she did what most moms do. You look around the house, you look around the yard, you call all the neighbors because while you are panicked, you're like, oh, she could have run across the street. So very reasonable, all very reasonable. No, I mean, and as a mom, I can say that my first instinct would not be to call the police that my child had been abducted. My first instinct would say, oh, she went to go play with somebody. Oh, you know, she she found a hiding spot, something like that. Exactly. And at six years old, that would be very appropriate. Yeah. Absolutely. So when she does call 911 at 4.55 p.m., more than 100 volunteers show up. The police, they begin an intensive search. Like by 5 p.m., even the FBI is involved yeah. because now it's clear something is gone. She's She's gone and she's likely been taken. So they do all these door to door searches. They're questioning everyone. They've got canines tracking everything. So that that all happened on February 10th. 
on February 13th, so three days later, Faye's body is found in a wooded area not far from her house in a shallow grave. Stop, Poli stop, stop. Do you know who found her? The police chief. Oh, that's right. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's right. That's right. The police chief himself found her. And I'm, I'm not going to say it now, but how that shallow grave was put together and the materials that were used will go back to the evidence that police found. Yeah. So that's when they know they have a homicide on their hands. This is clearly a murder. So she's found dead. I think, I think mm -hmm. that they find a polka dot boot. Yes, her little rain boot in the trash. In the trash. And so that's when they start to search the wooded area in the back. <sighs> and by the way, the distances between the little girl's family and the suspect um, to the wooded area are incredibly close, Anna. Yeah, I mean, I talking know. hundreds of feet. I mean, close. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we see that a lot. And that, I think, is so, so hard when, especially for people who still have family members who have been abducted or presumed dead and are missing, the possibility that they could be so right close to you the yard. entire time. Right in your backyard. Oh, it's horrific. It's very frightening. It's very, very frightening. So um, here's what's also interesting, that Cody Scott Taylor, 30 years old, a neighbor, right, to Faye's family, is found dead at his home. So there's a lot going on all at once. You've got little girl has been day found day. dead, right? Day. This neighbor is has killed himself. He's slit his throat. He's killed himself. You've got the little boot that she w was wearing is found in the trash. Now, Taylor, Cody Taylor, had no previous criminal history. He had been interviewed by police the day before during the search. Um, he allowed officers into his home. Police went back to the house for more, and I that's when they found him dead. Yes, go ahead. I yep, need go a ahead. minute. Take it. That, that's, that sat, that was strange for me. So, you know, police are going door to door, right? So you're going door to door. You're trying to look and see if she's there. You're trying to eliminate suspects. And his roommate would later claim that there was an odor. There was yeah. an odor. Yes. And that he tried to cover it up with this spray. And, you know, of course, look, police have a hard enough job. But the fact that they were in his home and that, according to the coroner, that grave was not dug and, you know, the, the soil around it and everything else is pretty fresh. So uh, I guess, right, we don't have all the facts, but according to the roommate, there was an odor in the days before in that house. And what happened there? I, I I need to know more about the search of his home. Right. That wasn't released. I need to know some more. Yeah. And it is three days. And of course, there would be decomposition. But, you know, th the thing is, I agree with you there. If the police had been in the house and by this time, Faye's body had already been moved out, I find it hard to believe that experienced police officers would not have picked up on that odor. And I'm just wondering is, you know, that the that the that the um, roommate is saying, oh, he's spraying air fresher, which he's never done before. Is it possible the police missed it? Yes, and, and not but, love, but I, I don't know if they would miss the odor of death. That is just something I don't think police would miss. Okay, and, and now I'm gonna jump ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but he, you know, he goes to Walmart, I think, and he buys all this this gardening, potting stuff, which is something he'd never done. And he Ubers there and they track down the Uber driver, right? They track down the driver, right? To taxi or an Uber. And um, the, the remark that the driver makes is, you know, he was, um, he was very evasive and he was nervous. And he didn't really, when I said, oh, you know, do you know the girl that's gone missing? He didn't want to talk about it. And then he said, I, and then he said, we never met. I, I don't know her. We never met. And so I have to believe that if he is showing signs of nervousness to the Uber driver, what was his interaction like with the police? It had to be 
Interesting, right? I mean, I think so. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you know, you and I, right, they come to our house. We say, come on in. Um, oh, how horrible this is. Is when when they spoke to him, and that's why I want to know more. How did he seem? How did he sound? I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Clearly something was going on because the police went back again. Yeah. And and of course, once she was found and the forensics were done, we can now start putting the pieces together because according to the Lexington County coroner, Faye died of asphyxiation within hours of her abduction, which means that if she disappeared that oh. afternoon, that by that evening she had passed already and yeah. they didn't find her for three more days. Right. So there's that that gives you a timeline for, was there an odor in the house? Maybe he was just very nervous and was spraying that, that you know, the, the roommate smelled something, but the cops didn't. I find that a little strange. The other thing is, of course, there's her little polka dot boot that was found in the trash. There was a soup ladle, um, apparently that was used to, um, you know, that looked like it had been used to dig for fresh dirt, which is right. a weird thing to use as a soup ladle. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. Yeah, it it's and dirt. and then there's the DNA. So DNA was tested and connected between the residents, between the residents. This is what they said early on between the residents, the male there, which would have been, you know, Cody and Faye. So and now let's yeah. both their DNA, both of their DNA is found on the soup ladle and her dna is found under his no is no it, his is fingernail no under? his dna is under her fingernails her correct right cody's dna is under phase fingernails correct. imperative absolutely imperative and remember all of this was happening within three days so not all that dna would have been available but That's this right. is that's right this is what we end up finding from the case and the case and the case files. So on July 6, 2021, the police department closes the case and releases the files and the evidence. And this is what they add, quote, all evidence which we are giving to you today indicates that Cody Taylor abducted and murdered Faye Swetlick. We are now considering this case closed. Police say that she was killed by Taylor within hours of the abduction. The approximate time of death has been determined to be about 8 p.m. Police say that when they were searching those trash bins in the neighborhood that they found, Faye's boot, as we said, and that ladle, as we said, we knew that early on. And that's what led them to start the search. We're kind of getting now their narrative. You know, there's the narrative we all experienced and now there's, right. this is their narrative. So um, the search of Taylor's home, because we didn't get all the details then, shows the Walmart receipt, which you referred to, that on September 13th, excuse me, that on February 13th, so that would have been three days after the abduction, um, seven in the morning it goes to Walmart. Okay, seven in the morning. I always say that he bought a garden trowel, potting soil, and fertilizer. And Cody told an employee that he was starting a garden. That's what he said. Okay, uh, kind of interesting. Then he takes the ride share, as you said, and that's, you know, they're having that weird conversation that, that we touched upon. Here's what's interesting. Remember, I said to you at the very beginning, remember how that grave was put together and what was used in Faye's shallow grave, it had that potting soil. Who uses potting soil? Do you know what I mean? It you was know, just- But I, I did think about this. And to me, it indicates the, not necessarily the why, but that this was a very impulsive decision that he made on the spot. Because he didn't really have a plan with what to do with her body once he had killed her because there he is going to Walmart buying potting soil and using a soup ladle. So I don't know I don't know if this brings the family any closure at all. And in fact it's sort of, you know, I mean that if this was an in fact a a impulsive decision, maybe it's even worse, right? I mean that yeah. 
Um, but but certainly it says to me that it wasn't well planned. I mean, it wasn't well planned. He's using, he, he I, I think he got so nervous and what do I do now? And he goes to Walmart 7 a.m. and buys potting soil. Yeah, also, you know, they did much more forensics in his home and they found that Faye's DNA was in a clothes hamper in that townhouse that he shared with the roommate, which is also very important because that means, I mean, she was likely in there, yeah. right? She was likely in that apartment. So um, the according to the summary release, they say that investigators did search Cody's home two times, uh, once on the day of the uh, February 12th. It's interesting, two times in one day. Yeah. Uh, on the 12th, isn't that interesting? Two, day, two yeah. times, one day. Right, and look, I am, um, these, these investigations are not easy ones, and um, whether they missed it or not, um, you know, I don't know if it would, I don't think it would have changed the circumstance because the no. death, the coroner determined was that day, right? So, she was already dead. Yeah. yeah. She was already yeah. dead by this point. Um, but it's something to, to consider, right? It's something to consider. How did, how did they miss that odor? Well, this is a quote from uh, the police report when everything was released. It says, quote, at the time of the consensual search, there was nothing overtly suspicious regarding the laundry bag and no evidence that made Taylor's home notable from the other residences mm -hmm. in that neighborhood. Right. So they're saying- There was nothing that stood out. There was nothing that stood out. They were doing their due diligence, but clearly something must have bothered them. This is what you say back. is missing. They went Something's, back. They went back in the same day. So clearly there we're was, not getting the whole picture here. Um, so the other thing is um, people say, people who knew Taylor say that they didn't know of any previous interactions between him and Faye or anything that he may have said to indicate anything. There appears to have been, he had no previous criminal history either. Otherwise they would have like zeroed in on him immediately. Right. right. Um, and it's still not clear whether he lured Faye away from the front yard or if he just snatched her. We still don't know that part. But at some point, because his DNA is in her fingernails, we know there was a struggle. Absolutely. Fighting for her life. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, you know, here is an issue that a lot of law enforcement agencies face that multiple investigating agencies have tried to get into Taylor's cell phone, but they have not succeeded, as we all know that it is near impossible if you do not have the password and no matter the sense of urgency, no matter how heinous um, the crime, we are finding it impossible to get into people's cell phones. And I have a real problem with that. I'm sorry, I got a real problem with that. I'm gonna disagree with you. <sighs> I'm gonna disagree with you and I'm gonna tell you why. You're killing me. I, I know, but there has to be a balance between people's privacy rights and the majority of people that have cell phones are honest, law-abiding people. And they have a right to store whatever they want in their phones without the government cracking their code and getting into their phone. And but when they are even convicted of the murder, when, I mean, I mean, come on now, Allison, there is a level here, there is a line we can cross. I hear you and it's called a warrant and it's called a, it, it, a judge can issue a search warrant into a phone. I absolutely understand. And as far as I understand the law, if there is a valid search warrant, the provider, whether it be Apple or whatever it is, has to comply. But I do want there to be some protection for individuals. Let's go back to Russ Ferrara. Okay, let's just use him. Mm -hmm. He was arrested and wrongfully charged with murder. So there are people that get into the system who have done nothing wrong and it's a huge invasion of their privacy. And I, I understand the invasion of the privacy and I respect that. Of course I do, you know, but here's the other thing. And, and I realize this may not be a, a good argument, but. Anything I look at in my phone, there are 
dozens, if not hundreds of tracking, marketing tracking cookies and everyone out there in the world can sell my information. They know everything I look at, what I buy, what I want to buy, where my car is parked. Yep. You all can collect all that information yep. about me yep. and my life, but God forbid I need help because something has happened to my child, right? Or someone has killed someone that I love and then good luck getting in any information then. Right. But the distinction is you don't want it to be the government that's doing it to people. And I, by the way, I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you in the sense that um, go that a, a judge better have the authority if if the probable cause is there mm -hmm. to issue that search warrant. And once there is a valid search warrant, the providers or whoever it is that can get into that phone better be willing to do it. I agree yes. with you, but I, yeah. I need that. The search that, warrant, I'm fine with that. I'm yeah. fine with that. But I feel like we have so many cases where search warrants are served, right? You're picking up the DNA, you're collecting all of this. So at this point, if you have, if you have search warrants for all of that, is it really that difficult to get one more search warrant for the telephone, for the phone records, and then to have the provider or the manufacturer open the damn device? By the way, all they need to do is hand it to like a nine-year-old kid. I know! But somehow they can get into a phone, no problem. It's the most amazing thing in the world. I know. Well, we could debate this forever, but I think, you know, we basically, I, I, I think we basically agree that once it comes to the point where we're not just saying just for the sake of it, but there has to be a warrant like there is to search a home and to search your car. Absolutely. But um, I do feel that there's so much pushback and I'm so sick and tired of those Apple billboards about protecting my privacy. It's like, yeah, yeah. that's what you're doing, Apple, right? That's what I pay a lot of money for. That's what you're doing because Even you track me. Even there, when there is a thought in my head that, oh my goodness, that purse is so cute. I love it. Maybe I should buy it. How does an ad pop up? I don't get it. Exactly. I think that there's the diagnostics in there that if your eyeball looks at it for more than three seconds, boom, we got gotcha. you. It's amazing. Yes. All right. All right. Enough on this. Anyways, sorry, sorry. We're never right. Okay. Interesting sideshow. Had to talk about it. <laughs> okay. We got to move on. <laughs> It is now time for our comment section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media and our very own Owen Michael is here with that. Hey, Owen. Hi, Anna. Hi, Allison. Good to see you both and hear from you. Uh, yes, we do get comments across our social media platforms and on our website and we read them all. Stop in and weigh in. Uh, this week we've got this story is the a Taco Bell shift leader was arrested for felony arson this week a week after a fire caused more than $30,000 in damage at the Nashville location. Surveillance video reportedly shows Taco Bell employees locking the doors for the restaurant and quotes, running around the inside of the store with fireworks in their hands on Monday, July 5th, according to the Nashville Fire Department. Employees then accidentally locked it, excuse me, they accidentally locked themselves out of the restaurant while a fire burned inside and firefighters were called who had to then break in to put out the fire more arrests are expected, according to the Nashville Fire Department. Tori T says that's one way to get fired with a bang. <laughs> Delegato A says this sounds like an episode with SpongeBob and Patrick. And Jody A says this quote unquote team building is different. So, yes, we uh, would love to hear what you guys think about that particular story. No good could come of this, right? No good could come of this about running around the inside of a store with fireworks. And then, you know what? Obviously, I don't think they meant to set the place on fire. They were probably just the pro that was the problem. They weren't thinking. They Wait, weren't thinking. And when I read it, I, I don't even know how to say this because I, I have three boys, right? I immediately thought of like potty jokes and with, <laughs> with Taco Bell and an explosion. And I'm like, oh, my God, my kids would have a field day with this story. There were some uh, comments like that. I chose to leave them off this week. I'm sorry. We did have some reaction to that. Um, I would not defend uh, any of these people's uh, 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 actions here, but I worked in a fast food restaurant when I was 15 or 16. My judgment was not particularly good. I get, you know, it's a day after 4th of July, you're blowing off steam, you're having a little fun. But um, yeah, fireworks are, uh, you know, it's not all fun and games. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, this was one of the more stupid ways to blow off some steam. Yeah, yeah. tough way to lose your job. Yeah. Yeah, really, especially, oh, yeah. 
I honestly, I don't think that they believe they were going to get locked out. And at that point, that's it. Fire's out of control. And I assume that the employee discount goes away once this happens. They no longer have this. I will try to reach out for comment on that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can do that, Allison. You can contact Taco Bell. (laughs) Thanks, Owen. See you next week. Bye, guys. That was quite an episode, Allison Treasel. Thank you for coming on, as always. Love it. Always love being here with you. I know. We're going to have to, like, start doing, like, cocktails and food. Like, we're, you know, going to have to do it all. We're going to have to have, like, a special podcast for that. I totally agree. Would love (laughs) that. Well, where can people find you if, one, they need a criminal defense attorney, uh, two, if they need help unlocking their phone, three, (laughs) if they just want to follow you on social media? Uh, Thank you, Anna. So I am a practicing criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles. My website is allisontreasellaw.com. I also um, can be seen on KTLA, which is a Los Angeles local news station, as well as the legal expert at Access Hollywood. And we wish your son great success with his baseball game. (laughs) Thanks, Anna, for having me. Love it. Love it. You all can find me, Anna G News, uh, all social media sites. You can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes I think I just don't need to keep listing them. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us, of course, on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. And also you can subscribe to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>